Okay. Bueno, pues muy buenos días. Vamos a comenzar con el segundo día. Eh, nuestro primer conferencista es Mark Stiakowski, eh, quien está pasando con nosotros un año después de haber hecho varias visitas mediante una delegación del CNRS. Eh, nos vas a hablar sobre resolución. So, resolution of singularities and Nash blowing up. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. It's a great honor. I love Mexico. I love Cuernavaca. I think it's a great place to work. It's <coughs> and this is a great occasion for all of us. <coughs> so the, the, the first topic is uh, resolution of singularities in algebraic geometry. So algebraic geometry studies algebraic varieties. <coughs> so I'm, I'm going to find algebraic variety. is a set embedded in the Euclidean space. So, so K, K, K is a field here. So X is embedded in the Euclidean space and, and defined by simultaneous vanishing of several polynomial equations. Okay. So X is, is of the form. All the points <coughs> such that finitely many equations vanish where the fi's are polynomials in n variables. So for example, uh, for example, a nodal curve. I squared minus. Or in higher dimensions, uh, or surfaces. Uh, well, a uh, non-degenerate quadratic cone, that's, uh, that's another algebraic variety. So y squared, z squared minus x squared, minus x squared equals zero. And uh, maybe I'll mention the an singularities which already came up in Christophe Sorges' talk. I don't know really how to draw them. So this is a, this is called sometimes an a1 singularity, a n. I don't really know how to draw them. So z n plus one minus x y equals zero. <coughs> so m most points on every algebraic variety are non-singular. There are some special points like uh, self-intersections, cusps. So in these in these examples, uh, here there's one singular point at the origin, and here too there's one singular point at the origin. Uh, Non-singular points locally, if you look under a microscope, look, look like, uh, like pieces of Euclidean space. Um, and algebraically, singularities are detected by, by vanishing of partial derivatives. So to be, to be precise, uh, uh, okay, here, here I'll use the notation. I'll, I'll say that x is the zero set of these L equations. <coughs> so. So if x happens to be a hypersurface, if it's defined by a single equation, like in all these three cases, um, the singular locus is, is given by the vanishing of all the partial derivatives. <coughs> this makes sense, right? Because if, if one of the partial derivatives doesn't vanish, that means we're in the situation of the implicit function theorem. So locally, our varieties at least analytically, is a graph of a function. So that's why it's locally isomorphic to, to the Euclidean space. And if, in the, in the general case, <coughs> the singular locus is given by the vanishing of the Jacobian ideal. The Jacobian ideal is J is generated, generated by all the R by R minors of the Jacobian matrix, of the matrix of partial derivatives. And the reason is the same, right? If where R is the code I mentioned. X and KM. 
So and the reason is the same, that if uh, one of the uh, such minors doesn't vanish, we're in the situation of uh, implicit function theorem in several variables. Uh, and in, in particular, a singular locus is, is a sub-variety. It's defined by imposing some additional equations. And of course, we have a natural notion of, uh, well, we can glue more complicated varieties from affine ones, just like you know, manifolds and topology are glued from pieces of the Euclidean space. And we have a natural notion of morphism, which is polynomial maps. Morphisms are polynomial. <coughs> so I'm a singularity theorist. My main interest one of my main interests in working with singularities is getting rid of them by, by certain permissible transformations. Uh, that's the problem of resolution of singularities. Uh, so resolution of singularities already came up in Christophe Sauger's talk, but uh, I'll explain it from scratch you know, for grandmother's sake or for grandmothers among you. <laughs> so, so what are these permissible transformations? I guess maybe I should say for specialists that I, I, I didn't say this, but you know, most of the time I'll assume that my, my variety is irreducible. It's defined by prime ideal, but, but I, I didn't want to get into technicalities. So, <coughs> so a morphism is said to be birational. If there exist proper sub-varieties of X and of X prime, say Y, in X and Y prime, X prime, such that pi induces an isomorphism outside of these proper sub varieties. So. Okay, so in other words, so a map is birational, it means that we remove a sub variety from X and we glue some, some other sub variety in its place. And this, this is sometimes called the, why sometimes called the center of blowing up. Center of, of, of the blowing up. And this is sometimes called the exceptional divisor, the exceptional set. Okay. So what is the resolution of singularities? Uh, Resolution of singularities of X of X is a is a birational proper morphism such that X prime is non-singular. So uh, if we're in the classical situation, say, over the real numbers or over the complexes, you should think of proper, uh, it's just the usual proper in topology. Uh, the pre-image of compact, compact set is compact. Now, in characteristic P, or in more general case, it's, it's harder to define what it means. But <coughs> roughly speaking, it means that there are, there are no holes in the fibers. The fibers are pr projective or, or, or proper, vari complete varieties. OK. And, uh, <laughs> and ob obviously, you know, if, if I didn't say this word proper, then the problem of resolution of singularities would be trivial, right? I would just take x prime to be x minus a singular locus. So, so, so I mean, it's, it's important to say proper. <coughs> so, for example, uh, for example, in the case of a nodal curve, the self-intersecting curve, what we can do is, uh, it's, uh, intuitively, it's kind of obvious what, what we should do. So, 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 so usually uh, we have to remove the singular locus from X, but we have to glue something else in its place to make the whole thing proper. So in this case, it's kind of obvious what we should do. We should just remove the singular point. Just take apart the two branches. So this amounts to 
removing the singular point and gluing in two points in this place. So here, the, this is the center of blowing up, and the exceptional divisor consists of two points. <coughs> of course, we're, we're algebraic geometers, so we want to do it everything algebraically and systematically. So usually what is done is uh, we embed our singular variety in some ambient non-singular space, and we, try, we define proper birational morphisms on this ambient non-singular space, and then we see what happens to our, to our singular variety. So for, for example, in this case, what we do is we blow up the plane at a point. So the origin. So, so, so what this amounts to is, so, so again, I'll remove the origin. The origin will be the center of blowing up, and I'll replace it by something else. Uh, so I consider the totality of all lines passing through this point. They form a P1, OK? and so. So I, I replace the point by, by a P1, one-dimensional projective space. That's going to be my exceptional divisor. And nothing else changes. OK, so now in the, in the, the blowing up is no longer fine. It's glued from two affine pieces. And the lines no longer intersect. OK, but everything else stays the same. So for example, if K is R, K is the real numbers, you should think of it, this is just a very bad picture of, of the Mergus band. Right? There is a line which goes around once. It comes back to itself. <coughs> so similarly, of course, we can write everything explicitly, all the transformations with equations, but I won't do it right now because uh, that's not my main interest today. <coughs> so similarly, we can blow up a point in any Euclidean space on so origin in K, and, and, and that's very similar. What what we do is we consider a totality of all lines passing through the origin. They form a Pn minus 1, and that's going to be my exceptional device. I replace the origin by Pn minus 1. Now, upstairs, the lines no longer intersect, and everything else outside of the center of the blog up and the exceptional device, everything stays the same. So if you like, you can think of this. This is upstairs. We have the total space of the line bundle, the unique line bundle on Pn minus 1 of churn class minus 1. So we have Pn minus 1, and I have this line bundle O of minus 1. And if I collapse the zero section, I get back the Euclidean space. <coughs> and finally, uh, just for completeness sake, we could, we could also blow up. We could take the Euclidean space, Kn. We can blow up some coordinate subspace, Kl, defined by you know, n minus Sorry, let me say k n minus l, defined by l equations. And, and this is, I won't do the details, but if you understand the previous picture, so you should think of taking a transversal cross section, kl, l dimensional Euclidean space, and in this transversal cross section, the picture looks exactly like this, like before with n replaced by l. And this is a kind of, and then you just take a direct product with k n minus l. So, so in this case, along Kn minus L. So in this case, the exceptional divisor will be a trivial Pn minus 1 bundle over the center of the blowing up over, over Kn minus L. <coughs> OK. And again, everything can be written down with equations. I, I guess maybe to, to be more, more sophisticated, more general, if you have a, if you have a non-singular sub-variety, Y of another non-singular variety Z, when you blow up Y, you replace Y. The exceptional divisor looks like projectivized normal cone, well, in this case, normal bundle of, of Z, of Y and Z. And the most general conceivable blowing up, if you have, a, if y is a, is a zero set of, locally, a zero set of a certain number of equations on z. So another way of thinking about blowing up is, is you consider, uh, you consider z minus y, and consider a map from this to the 
S minus one dimensional projective space given by, by these equations. So every point since for S tuple, S tuple like this, G1 of C, Gs of C, that's a well-defined point in the projective space precisely because we excluded the common zero set of these equations. So let me call this map phi. And then what you do is you consider the, the graph of phi in P1 cross Z, the direct product, and you take the Zariski closure. So this. <coughs> This natural maps to Z by the second projection. It's obviously birational because, uh, because it's an isomorphism outside of Y by definition, and it's, it's projective proper, et cetera. Okay, so in the, so the resolution of singularity is known to exist in over fields of characteristic zero. That's the great zero of Hironaka. I guess an, ex an exercise for you is that you can show that the AN singularities are resolved by, so AN is embedded in K3. You can check that it's resolved by a succession of point blowing ups. Just keep blowing up the origin approximately N over two times. <coughs> okay, so, so there is a great theorem of Hironaka from the 60s. Or so, uh, every so if the characteristic of the field is zero, every algebraic variety <coughs> variety admits a resolution of singularities. And characteristic P, this is still open, although. Good progress is being made. I mean, there are quite a few people working on this, including myself, but not only myself. So I'm confident that we'll have this soon. But for now, it's still open. <coughs> Hironaka's proof is complicated, 200 pages. Even the most modern, simplest proofs are maybe about 60 pages. And it proceeds by, so, so you take your singular variety x, you embed it in the ambient non-singular variety z, and it proceeds by blowing up non-singular centers, so blowing ups exactly of the form that I described here. And, and this, and it's, it, if you believe everything I said until now, the, this already shows that the algorithm must, must have a certain complexity, right? Because the singular locus itself might be singular. And at some point, every point of the singular locus should be blown up. So among other things, at least we should desingularize the singular locus itself and then, and then blow it up. But so there is a kind of hierarchy of there is the hierarchy of singularities. You know, it could be a kind of descending chain of sub varieties. You have to successively you know, start with the worst one, start desingularizing the worst one, and so on. So, and John Nash uh, was very excited about this theorem. This is, this is the first half of the 60s, so this is probably the last thing that jo John Nash did before a long interruption of his activities due to illness. So he had already been in and out of psychiatric hospitals. And but he was very excited and it made him think of several great ideas. For example, Nash's arc space and the Nash problem, which I won't talk about today. But another idea that Nash, oh, and so not only Hironaka's proof is very complicated, but it's very complicated to state what the algorithm is. There are many, many pages to, to explain the algorithm. You see, if you have a, if you have a singular curve, it's obvious what to do, you just blow up the point. Singularities are isolated, so you just keep blowing up these isolated singularities. But starting with surfaces, it's not obvious which centers to blow up. And the algorithm is very, very difficult to, even to, and long to stay. So Nash suggested a very beautiful conjectural algorithm. So let me say what it is. Uh, in, it, it only works in characteristic zero. Only, it, it's only useful in characteristic zero. So, so, so I take my singular variety x. This, this is sort of, the, yeah, okay, so let, let me take my singular variety x, 
and let, let's say uh, I'm working over the complexes. It's, let's say locally it's, it's embedded in some Euclidean space. And let us consider the Gauss map, which is defined outside of the singular locus. So what is the Gauss map? So the Gauss map sends every non-singular point to its tangent space, but viewed as an element. So let's say, uh, let's say small n is the, is the dimension of x. And so let me view the tangent space as a point in a suitable Grassmannian. So Grassmannian of small n planes in capital N dimensional. Euclidean space. Right, let me denote this by G. <coughs> and, and then let's consider the graph of phi and <coughs> x cross the Gaussmannian. And let's take the closure. Okay. And again, this, this maps to x by the first projection. Uh, this, again, is obviously birational because it's an isomorphism. It's, it's a graph of, of something over the non-singular points. It's projective because you're proper because Grassmannian is projective. <coughs> so Nash blowing up does nothing to the non-singular points, but every singular point is replaced by all the limits of tangent spaces of non-singular points converging to it. Okay. So again, if, for example, if we look at our old friend, the nodal curve, <coughs> You see that no, nothing happens with non-singular point, but, but at the singular point, there are two possible limits of tangent spaces of non-singular points converging to it. Therefore, after Nash blowing up, the two branches get separated. And I guess you know, this works for any ordinary singularity, any, you know, any singularity where branches are non-singular with distinct tangents. And usually, of course, you can't expect this to desingularize in one step, but Nash is, but this is very beautiful. It's very simple to state, canonical. Uh, and Nash's question to Hironaka, Nash, as far as we know, never wrote anything down about this, but there's oral communication with Hironaka. So his question was, so Nash's question was, let's iterate this procedure. We have this perfectly well-defined canonical procedure. Let's, let's apply it. So let me call this, so let, let, let me call this, denote this by N for Nash. Okay, so let's apply Nash, iterate, it's canonical, the algorithm is very simple to state. So is it true, so is it true that xi is non-singular, non-singular for i sufficiently large? And there is a variation of this. You can uh, throw normalization into this. So, so let me call this Nash normalization. And you can ask the same question. Normalization is, came on the scene remarkably late in algebraic geometry. So it shows the power of algebraic language. In the algebraic language, it's a very natural procedure. It consists of replacing the coordinate ring by its normalization, by its integral closure, this field of fractions. It, analytically, or geometrically, it's harder to say what it means. Uh, I guess if you're, if you're over the complexes, normalization takes apart all the branches of your variety, but also uh, you agree to every meromorphic function which is bounded locally, you agree to consider as a regular function at that point. So you, you increase the ring of regular functions. Okay, so, so this is very beautiful, very nice. Unfortunately, nothing is known. Well, it's, you know, almost nothing is known as far as the answer to Nash's question. So there is a, there is a theorem of Augusto Nobile from the 60s, oh, sorry, from the 70s. It says that Nash is an isomorphism. It's an isomorphism if and only if x is non singular. Of course, if, of course, is trivial, but the other direction is you know, if this theorem were not true, this would be really bad news for the Nash question because if we could have a single variety such that Nash does nothing to it, that would be a problem. Then certainly the answer would be no. And, uh, but this is not, not trivial to prove, but it's a, it's a good theorem. Um, and corollary of this is that Nash resolves singularities 
in dimension one. If if x is a curve, then the answer is yes. Why? Because for curves, the resolution of singularities is, is known to be finite, a finite morphism over a curve. So, so Nobilis, if my curve is singular, Nobilis theorem says that uh, something changes, and I only have a finite way to go. Therefore, you know, this can only stabilize when the curve becomes non singular. Um, in dimension two, there is a theorem of my PhD thesis. Uh, dimension equal to two, uh, yes, for Nash followed by normalization. That's a proof is about 170 pages long. It's, a, it's not, not an easy theorem. And without normalization, not much is known. <coughs> there, is a, there is a work of my Mexican PhD student, Daniel Duarte, and independently by Bernard Tissier and Pedro Gonzalez Perez. Uh, yeah, so if x is a surface and characteristic zero, and if you apply Nash blowing up at each step, Nash blowing followed by normalization, and you iterate that, then for i sufficiently large, it becomes non singular. Okay. But without normalization, nobody knows. So let me, I, I don't have that much time left, so let me state a combinatorial problem, which Okay, maybe before I say this, so, so these people worked on Nash blowing up for toric varieties, okay? Toric varieties are, so, so an, an algebraic torus is C star, C minus is the group, multiplicative group of C, C minus the origin, uh, to the nth, the direct product itself n times, that's an algebraic torus, and toric varieties are those varieties of dimension n on which this algebraic torus acts and in which it can be embedded as a dense orbit. So, and, and these are, they're basically combinatorial objects. And that's why it's a great source of examples because in principle, everything about them can be translated into combinatorial statements. Okay, and so this goes both ways. <coughs> sometimes we are lucky to solve a combinatorial problem, but sometimes, conversely, uh, some theorems, have, good theorems are proved in combinatorics by translating, translating them into toric varieties you know, translating polytopes into toric varieties and applying standard theorems like Poincare duality or hard left shift theorem. So, so let me finish by telling you a combinatorial problem, which we don't know how to solve. So take, let, let me take an irrational number. Okay, and let's consider so, so, so I can think of this as a defining a linear functional, say, on, on Z2. So, so the linear functional is, is just x plus alpha y, okay? And so the set of points which are positive, on which this functional is positive, this is a half plane which lies you know, on one side of some line with irrational slope. And now let me take a semigroup. Let me, so, so this is a picture of Z2. Let me take finitely many vectors in Z2, such that the, my functional is strictly positive on all, of course it cannot be zero on the normal of Z2. And let's consider the semigroup generated by these guys. So all the all the linear combination, so these guys with non-negative integer coefficients. And now let's consider the, the following transformation. So let me transform the semigroup as follows. So the new, the new semigroup is going to be, oh, and let me order these, of course, the, my function takes different values on all these gamma i, so let me order them by increasing order. Actually, the, the, so only the first two matters, the others don't matter. So, so the new semigroup will contain the, the two smallest elements, gamma one, gamma two, and all the differences. All the other vectors minus so gamma i minus gamma one and gamma j minus gamma two. And there is a mild uh, 
non degenerous conditions which you don't have to worry about, which is almost always satisfied anyway. I mean, don't worry about this one. And this is, so this, this is one move of my game. And then I can iterate the procedure, so I can generate. OK, and the question is, well, prove that, that for i sufficiently large, phi i is generated by two elements. So roughly speaking, this is the question of, so if you take a toric variety, not necessarily normal, and apply Nash blowing up without normalization, iterate it, uh, that's roughly speaking what this tra translates in, in combinatorics. And being a non-singular surface, non-singular toric surface means that the same group is generated by two elements. Uh, I, I'm sorry, yeah. the V here is set or it's a semi-group? It, it, it's, it's a semi-group generated by these guys, so it's the set of all all linear combinations of these with non-negative integer coefficients. <coughs> okay, so this is, yeah, yeah, it's time. Okay, so so yeah, let me just stop here. So anyway, nobody in the universe knows this, and uh, if you can solve this, you have proved uh, resolution for toric varieties by Nash blowing up. Okay, okay, and it's maybe just one last sentence. Is uh, is very surprising. We're, we're, you know, D D Daniel did a lot of computer experience. It's very surprising because apparently the size of the number of generators doubles at each step. So it doubles, 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 and suddenly, th this is not a minimal set of generators. Suddenly it comes down to two. Nobody knows why. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, in, in characteristic P, nothing works because you see that Nobilis, Nobilis theorem is false in characteristic P. Let me give you a counter example. Okay, so let's consider the plane curve y to the P minus x to the Q. See, Nash blowing up is almost the same as blowing up the Jacobian ideal. And for complete intersection, it's exactly blowing up the Jacobian ideal. So, but you see here, the Jacobian ideal is principal, right? The P, I mean, the derivative with respect to y is zero. So the Nash blowing up is an isomorphism. So and again, nobody has any suggestions for how to get around this. Very good. So, next uh, speaker. Oh. <laughs>